My name is Robert Kutz, uh, and I'm the chief editor of the journal Prairie History. Uh, we are uh, marking the release of our um, third issue of the journal by interviewing some of the authors from the new uh, issue uh, about their articles. So today I'm joined by uh, Paul Newsom, who wrote uh, an article for the uh, issue entitled, let me get the title straight here, Salvation of a Prairie Dog, the survival story of Canada's oldest working steam locomotive. So Paul has been involved with the uh, Vintage Locomotive Society for the past 50 years, which is very impressive. He has seen, uh, he has been, sorry, a fireman and engineer on uh, engine number three, and has been the general manager of the Vintage Locomotive Society for the past several years. And uh, as I say, Paul, I, there's a couple of questions I have, but um, if you want to talk about the article and uh, its genesis and just uh, to give our readers a little uh, background about what you wrote, that would be great. Sure. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, the article, I wrote the article uh, with the focus on when number three had to get its boiler replaced back in 2001. Um, we didn't know at that particular point whether we're going to stop running steam. Uh, we didn't know what the heck to do because that's a major, major change. The boiler itself was built in 1909, put on number three, uh, and replaced the 1882 boiler. So I wrote the article and I did the research on the facts that are presented in the article. Um, I'm thinking that your readers will, will appreciate some of that. But... We didn't know when I wrote that article, um, initially I did a draft and I set it aside for a few years. We didn't know where we we're going to go with the whole thing. We, we really didn't know whether it was going to work out okay. In fact, it has. I mean, the boiler and number three have been back running for over 10 years now. But um, it was a challenge. Uh, we're try we were taking an 1882 or a 1909 boiler, I'm sorry, and applying 2004 at that time, uh, engineering requirements. And uh, I described in a, in a short way, I think in the article, how we as a group, myself and a few other uh, gentlemen, we interacted with Saskatoon Boiler who built the boiler. Uh, I went to Ottawa to the National Museum and spoke with a gentleman there as I related in the article. We couldn't find any drawings of the engine. So what had to happen is the boiler had to be sent down to Saskatoon and their engineering people used it as a basic template to do up all the engineering drawings and, and everything worked out very well. I mean, I'll cut it off at that because I could go on forever, but it was a very, um, Certainly for me and for everybody else, it was a very uh, interesting and uh, learning experience. You can't replace a boiler on an 1882 steam locomotive without spending a lot of time worrying about this and that and learning a lot of things. I mean, we had a couple of oh my God moments, but uh, they got resolved and um, we're all the better for it. I'm ready to tackle another one, quite frankly. Just uh, on, on replacing the boiler, um, the question I had when I was, or not, that I was thinking about when I read your article was um, looking at the technology of that time period and then trying to work with that technology, was that a very difficult undertaking or did you have people that were knowledgeable in that area? Well, here's how I can answer your, your, your uh, observation, Robert. Number one, the technology, steam technology is, is fairly basic and doesn't change that much. But mm. the technology required to reconstruct an identical version of that boiler, which was 1909, 1882, whatever, it eliminated all the riveting. That's the biggest thing. It eliminated all the riveting so that the boiler is entirely welded. And to tell you and the listeners what that might mean in real terms, when we lifted the boiler, the old boiler, to put it on a trailer, 
the cranes, which all have, have uh, weighing devices, clocked in at 30,000 pounds. The new boiler, when it came back to be installed, came back at 24,000 pounds. So there was 6,000 pounds of rivets, uh, plates, and, and the thickness of the steel too that was required. So that, in answer to your question about the technology, is one of the biggest obvious differences. Visually, you can notice, if you look carefully, where the boiler is welded as opposed to uh, riveting, especially in the cab. But um, the technology is the same, and that was the only um, hurdle, if you wish, that had to be overcome. Um, well, that's very interesting. I, I, uh, to get onto a broader subject, you uh, in your bio, it says that... Um, You've been involved with the, uh, sorry, Vintage Locomotive Society for 50 years, which is very impressive. How did you get involved and what motivated you to uh, get involved? Okay, my interest in trains and steam engines in particular, he started in 1954 when I was two years old. My grandfather was a locomotive engineer and he retired in 1954. And uh, my father took me down to the station, the former uh, CN station, and uh, it got in me even at that early age. And um, I knew about the Prairie Dog from the early 60s. I mean, I make reference to some of the, uh, the history of, of number three and so on in, in the article. Um, I became aware of the running of number three in 1970, early 1970, I went down to the station when they did a test run prior to the July 1st Trudeau trip. And uh, I saw it then. I wasn't a member. I was not in the city even when the July 1st trip took place. Through acquaintances, in answer to your question, through acquaintances, uh, when the train was going to start running public excursions, uh, I was asked if if wanted to go down and, and help wipe the engine. That was I couldn't go down on July 11th, which is the first public day of operation. I went down on July the 12th, 1970, and I've been with it ever since. And I mean that's literally true. Uh, I have not wavered. Uh, I went to Montreal even when I went to Montreal for a couple of years for for my job. Uh, I was still working on Prairie Dog administrative stuff down in Montreal. So uh, and that was before fax machines even. So. But so, been, uh, uh, the members of the Vintage Locomotive Society, are they, they're all volunteers? They're um, pretty much all volunteers. We have some contracted people. I happen to be an employee, a full-time employee, because mm -hmm. it's, just, it's, it's far more complex than one can imagine because, uh, because of financial requirements, because of regulatory requirements, because of maintenance requirements. But basically, they're all volunteers. Um, and they're not necessarily railroad people. This is one of the things over mm. the last 50 years, and literally I've talked to thousands of people, and um, a number of them have, have, to my surprise, all expressed the idea that they'd like to become involved with the society and the Prairie Dog, but they don't feel capable because they are maybe uh, a storekeeper or, or something non-railroad, and I've told them, many occasions, men, women, you name it, uh, young and old, you don't have to be a railroad person. Mm -hmm. If you have an interest, we do a lot of training and we look after people's safety, of course, and we look for what your interest might be and, and we get them involved. We've had a lot of people who are non-railroad people. So the listeners today uh, should understand that this is not a bunch of old railroad guys, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I could go off on a tangent. My sister, my late sister, was a locomotive engineer for CN, and she was mm -hmm. a fireman on, on number three um, way back in the 70s. Um, so, you know, it, it's, a, it's a group of volunteers. Um, now, of course, we're in lockdown because of the COVID, but uh, we usually get together Wednesdays and Saturdays and sometimes Tuesday evenings uh, to do all kinds of maintenance work. I'm interested in your comment about your sister being, did you say an engineer? In, yes, in a locomotive stuff? engineer for CN. So how, 
how unique was that for a female to be in that uh, position? She was a, officially, uh, I think she was the second female locomotive engineer in Canada. There was a lady by the name of, and I stand to be corrected, but I believe it was Anne Livingston in Vancouver. And mm -hmm. Kathy, my sister Kathy, my late sister Kathy, qualified in 1979. There's another lady who went in at the same time as her, uh, who is currently still working for Central Manitoba Railway. But Kathy, Kathy was unique. Uh, and so was this other lady I'm referring to. Um, I was working at CN at the time uh, for a summer job. Uh, I was a brakeman uh, for a number of years. And, and I even met her on the road coming back from Rivers one time and she was heading out to Dauphin, I believe it was. So it was very unique, very unique. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's extremely interesting. I guess uh, uh, maybe my uh, final question is, um, where do you see the, and you talk a little bit about it in, in your article, but where do you see the future of Prairie Dog Central um, you know, in terms of maintaining operation and uh, that sort of thing. Um, well, what's your view on that? Okay, I'm sorry for interrupting you. The trade itself continues to be five turn of the century, turn of the last century, wooden coaches in the 1882 steam engine. What we have been doing of late is developing the experience, the passenger experience. And by that, I mean at our stopover, which is in Grosval, we have been setting up, which is another article entirely, a um, heritage village based on, on, on uh, availability of buildings and so on and so forth. So when people come there and we spend the 90 minutes of ground time, they can, uh, of course, get a bite to eat, but they can also view a, a vintage station. Uh, there's a 1912... Uh, church, there's a single room schoolhouse, and there's an 1889 home. All have been restored, okay? So in response to your query about where do we see us going, it's developing the experience of the passengers. We've got more happening that we're going to be doing in the station itself, which is a 1926 or 1923, I should say, former CN station. We want to create and add to the, when a person comes out and rides a train, they're writing in what was used, not a replica, but was actually used. Right. The youngest coach we have is 1912, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and people see that the steam engine itself. I mean, there are still 1882 parts on it. And that's a whole other thing. I could, I could show you pictures that I've taken of, of the parts, but we want people to understand this is how Canada grew. Canada is a result largely of the Canadian Pacific Railway, and it joined us from coast to coast. The Prairie Dog Central is a perfect example of how the prairies got developed in the turn of the century. Uh, in 1905, Sir Clifford Sifton was the, uh, the immigration minister for Sir Wilfrid Laurier. And it was trains like ours that brought people in from the coast, from, from, from Europe, and they took them across Canada and, and how various communities grew and developed. So sorry for being long-winded, but that's pretty much how I can best describe it. Well, uh, thank you very much for the article. I think it's extremely interesting. Um, and uh, certainly um, uh, relevant to uh, 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 Manitoba and Prairie people in terms of the, the history. Um, and thank you again for uh, that wonderful photo on the cover that we used for the issue. Um, that was great. And uh, I thank you for that. I think it, it, it added quite a lot to this issue and um, Prairie history in general. So thank you, Paul. And uh, thank you for joining us today. And thank you for listening. Take care of yourself. Yes, you too.